Welcome back to episode number seven. Uh, welcome to episode number seven of the Deep Drive in the Left Field podcast. My name is Jack, otherwise known as LB Nerds on Instagram and, and uh, Relevant. And I'm here with uh, my co host, Ryan Garcia, otherwise known as Ryan Garcia ESM on Twitter and Yankee Stat Talk on Relevant. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of transactions, whether it's Justin Turner and James Paxton, and we'll be going over our top 10 uh, shortstops. Uh, we'll be hearing from both James and Jackson on that matter. Before we get into it, though, Quick shout out to our sponsor, Relevant. Uh, if you want, if you want the best uh, social media networking app, Relevant's the place to be. You can create a chat and you can record uh, podcasts of all interest, whether it's sports, cooking, or any other hobbies you have. Um, go check out the link in our bio on our Instagram at Deep Drive Pod uh, to download the app Relevant. Uh, and feel free to DMs any questions if you have any questions about the app itself. Thank you to Relevant for sponsoring today's podcast, and let's get into it. As there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. Starting off uh, for today, uh, the, the Dodgers uh, re-signed Justin Turner on a two-year deal worth $34 million with a club option. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the club option the third year is worth. I think it's like it's like 15, I think. Somewhere around that. Somewhere around that. Let's just say it's like 15. Um, I'll, I'll get started. I don't really have too much to say as Turner was on the Dodgers before. Besides the fact that the Dodgers would have had a bad offseason, in my opinion, or not a bad one, it would have been pretty mediocre if they didn't bring back Turner, given that they did pay Trevor Bauer what he did, and I don't think he's on the same planet or uh, or tier as what Turner is as a player. They got some very solid relief arms, uh, relief arms and Alex Vesia. Um, they brought back uh, they, they brought back Trinan. They got Knable. So they got a couple good relievers, but I don't think it would have given them a net positive with the, the negative that I see as Bauer. Again, other people don't see it that way, and that's fine. Um, but I'll just say, uh, the Dodgers are going to be fucking insane this year. Uh, clearly the favorites, there's really no argument for any other team. The playoffs are a crapshoot at the end of the day, but you know, they're clear favorites and they'll probably win it again. So Ryan, what are your thoughts on the Turner signing? Well, I, I agree with your assessment of, it does definitely push them into like, you cannot doubt that they're the favorites. Uh, but one thing I will say is that I don't think that this move is one. I, I really think that the, the biggest thing to take away from this move is the Dodgers are the team when it comes to having money, the team, when it comes to being a free agent destination, they've established themselves as what the, the last decade of being, you know, division winners and always coming up short and, you know, having money and all that stuff, it's all come to fruition. They are now as analytical as they can be as, as possible. And they're the only team in baseball right now that, that does not care about money. They are blowing, they blew by the luxury tax. I think with the Austin Barnes arbitration situation, they're closing in on $260 million in, uh, of a payroll. And unless they shed payroll in other places, they're going to be blasting by that 210 mark. They have established themselves in my eyes as the best organization in baseball, the best franchise in baseball currently in terms of team to go to uh, the way they're, they're spending money. And it's, this is just an example. This is just kind of like the cherry on top of the amazing off season they've had in my eyes. Yeah. Even if they didn't bring out Turner, they still had guys like Edwin Rios uh, and Gavin Lux is when had a starting spot. If they're starting Taylor at second base, I'm not entirely sure if they are. Um, which goes to show you how incredible their depth depth is right now. Like, you know, Matt, Matt Beatty is probably the first guy off the bench for a lot of teams and he may not even make the roster. So um, yeah, I, I, well, Dodgers are clearly the best organization at this point in time. Um, and they're obviously don't give a flying fuck about the luxury tax, which is good for baseball. There's no denying that you can't really make fun of them for, for spending money. You can't say like, Oh, he, they bought their team. Not that it's true, but it, you know, spending that kind of money is a very big positive for the game. And that's my biggest takeaway uh, from, from the situation. Same, I think Ryan said as well. Ryan, any final thoughts on the Turner signing? Well, um, if anyone says, like, to Dodgers fans, if you're a fan of a baseball team and one of your responses to a Dodgers fan is, well, uh, you guys have to buy your rings or buy your team, you're just laughing at the Dodgers because your team is poverty and you have a poverty owner most likely. Like, unless you're a fan of the Red Sox or the Yankees at this – or, like, the Mets at this point – I, I guarantee you, your team does not have the the uh, monetary resources to go out at least in this off season and acquire whoever they wanted. Uh, even in the in the Mets and Red Sox case, they clearly wanted to stay under two ten. At least the Mets attempted to go over two ten. Um, so, if like ninety percent of baseball fans who say you know oh this team bought has to spend this amount of money to do this, 
you know, you're just mad because your team has a pod for the owner. And that's bad for baseball, and I feel bad for you. But don't go ahead and try to make fun of all your teams and act like it's a bad thing. That's great for baseball. It's amazing for baseball that, owner, that an owner or an ownership group in the Dodgers are blowing by that 210 and not giving a crap about it. Yeah, and uh, moving on to our next part, we're talking about uh, the, the Big Maple. James Paxton leaves the Yankees, signs a one-year deal with the Mariners. Now, I actually knew about this before it was reported. Uh, unfortunately, I was second. Very sad. I could have really had something there. It is what it is. But um, like I like I was, I, what I was going to say really was, um, as a Yankees fan, it sucks to see Paxton go. I love Paxton. He's an incredible uh, 2019. He kind of carried the rotation from time to time. Um, problem with Paxton is, though, my initial reaction might have been a bit of an overreaction. I thought it was like the biggest the, the biggest steal of the offseason. If a team wasn't going to give Paxton $8 million, then there's probably something really, really wrong with his injuries and probably the Yankees would have easily given Paxton $8 million. You know, they probably would have preferred if Paxton was healthy, obviously to re-sign him for $8 million over someone like uh, Kluber. Though I do think the risk is worth $8 million for any team. And this is still a significant underpay. Uh, I think it's still important to recognize that there's probably an underlying issue that the public doesn't know about. And probably the Yankees mainly knew about as, you know, they were, you know, they were, they really had no interest in bringing him back. They didn't even make a formal offer. So Ryan, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the narrative that Paxton sucks if he doesn't throw 97 is a little bit overblown. Like I was looking into it a lot more because I used to think the same thing uh, before the podcast. Uh, and I looked into it. If you look at skill interactive ERA, it was actually pretty decent. His strikeout to walk numbers were fine. He was obviously pitching hurt, but if he's healthy, right, or at least healthy, right, but he's lost some velo and throwing 94, 95, I still think he can be a very effective pitcher. He's got great stuff, good rotations per minute. I mean, he doesn't have to be throwing 97 for his fastball to be good. If he gets those rotations per minute there, he's going to look like a very good start, and I think he's going to be worth $8 million. Let's say he pitches 150 innings and is a three nine ERA starter. That's more than worth $8 million, more than worth that. And to consider teams like the, like, I'm pretty sure Lester got around five to 6 million. Arietta got 6.5 million. Archer got 6.5 million. For Paxton to get 8 million, I think that's a good amount of money. And I'm surprised that no other team tried, like I'm surprised the Rays didn't try to go out and get him. I'm surprised because I, I feel like that would have been a perfect landing spot. Or like the Astros, the Astros with uh, Paxton would have uh, Granky, McCullers, and Paxton. And while Paxton's a risk, it's certainly one that you can, with your pitching development, turn into a amazing, amazing situation and go out and potentially compete in a very weak American League East. Expect, uh, American League East, American League. Um, and you have a weak division. You have good hitting. You're probably the favorites because the A's lost a bunch of players. Again, I feel like the Paxton situation is kind of a mess and the Mariners getting him makes me really scared for him, but other teams should have done at least something to try to get him. Yeah, I'm not denying that it's a significant underpay. I'm just saying, I feel like more teams would have been in on $8 million, like a contender such as the Astros or potentially the Mets. Apparently the Mets got outbid, which they could easily afford that. So I'm wondering if there's a really, really, really big injury risk we don't know about and they just didn't even feel like $8 million is worth it. Um, though I, I do agree with you, I think, even if he's like, say, a one-win pitcher, he, he's pretty much, they're paying one $8 million for one win, which is pretty much the, the baseline of what you want to be doing as a team. So either way, I think he's going to be like, uh, if he can, uh, if he's healthy and he's still throwing like 94 miles per hour, he can easily be like a two and a half win pitcher, which will yeah. you know, it, probably underpay the offseason in terms of money per war. And then that's not the end of the, that, that's not like the biggest thing. Uh, <laughs> that's not the biggest thing um, to, to worry about at the end of the day. I, I do think uh, that, that it's going to be worth it for sure. Well, I think the situation though with the Yankees is that Kluber was going to sign within that weekend after that tryout. And the Yankees were basically pressed with, do we want Paxton at, do we want to wait for Paxton's price to drop or do we want Kluber right now? And I think it's a fair, I think since they saw he looked healthy and they have that inside track with Cressy, uh, I think basically the Yankees said, we pick Paxton later and hope his price drops that we can afford him or it's pick up Kluber right now. And I, th and because Kluber was right there waiting for that was going to make a decision soon. They said, screw it. Give, give Kluber the money. Paxton's got to leave. I guess that's what's going to be. And I, and I, and I, I kind of agree with that assessment, at least from the Yankee standpoint, but you know, it's unfortunate because I really did like Paxton. So Ryan, uh, we're going to be going over, I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick recap of six minor league slash uh, very small major league uh, contracts that happened all one year deals. Uh, I'll just go through it. You give one word reaction to what you think about the deal. So Mike Montgomery signing with the Mets. Um, meh. Tommy Hunter signing with the Mets. Robbery. Justin Wilson signing with the Yankees. Good. Um, Matt Shoemaker signing with the Twins. Eh. 
I'd say it's better than eh, but whatever. It's it's eh. Um, uh, uh, Jason Kipnis signing with the Braves. Whatever. And uh, the Rays signing Rich Hill. Holy W. That's two words, but I don't care. <laughs> Before we get into our shortstop list, make sure to uh, a reminder to check out the relevant app. Uh, link is in our bio in the description. Uh, you can find it anywhere. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to DM me. We're excited to get that going. Big things coming with them. So getting into our top 10 shortstop list, we're going to do this as we do with all the other lists where uh, we go at each uh, position. So I'll say 10, Ryan says 10, James says 10, Jackson says 10, and so on. So I'll get started here. With number 10, I have Minnesota Twins shortstop, Arnold Simmons. I initially had uh, Tim Anderson. I'll just say this real quick, but I was bullied into to switching him. So congratulations, guys. Uh, Tim Anderson at number 11, and uh, we don't have to say number 11, honorable mention, and uh, Simmons at 10. Ryan, who do you have? Uh, I had Marcus Simeon at 10. I didn't know if he kind of – He's not top. a shortstop. But he played there last one. year, so I oh, had I to have close. him there. All right, never mind. Wait, wait, then I have to switch him there. All right, coming at number 10, I have White Sox shortstop Tim Anderson. Uh, what? Wait. Uh, if we're not counting Simeon, who was my – I thought – but Simeon counts as a short. Does he count as a shortstop? I don't – I have him as a second baseman. All right, so, so then – Right. So, so do I have to take? So, do you want me to take him off my list? Okay. I can, I can replace him by you. Ranking, ranking Seager, Correa, Baez, Tatis is impossible because okay, Seager no, and Correa have no sample size, and Tatis, Tatis has no sample so, size. But he's better right, than right. by a large margin. Are we? Are we not doing? Are, are we saying uh, Semyon's not a? a Am I really about to put Baez at four? Ryan, no, you're not. That would be terrible. No, Ryan, he's not. Ryan, not that. Jackson, are, did you consider uh, Semyon a shortstop or second base? Uh, second base. Right. Okay, so I'll move my guy off a of shortstop. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just find one quick one. Right number 10. Wait. I'm not putting DeJong there. Uh, fucking DeJong sucks. Uh, I've got Anderson at 10, by the way. If you guys know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not Korea putting DeJong at 8. Top 10. Cry. I'm not quite. You're supposed to I'm wait. Putting DeJong, I'm putting DeJong in. Are you going to doubt or are going to wait? Because we're supposed to wait to go through the list. <laughs> well, I'm making my list right now. How unprepared are you? I refuse to put Well, I have, I have this, but then I looked at stats right, okay. and it's okay, not. Okay, just can Yeah, you, we're going to cut Because we had to do like the combined list. So just like. So, all, right. all right. I got I got mine. I got mine done. Mine's done. Yeah, you, it. Hurry the fuck up. Let's go. Mine's not done, but I have 10, 9, 8, so we're good. Okay. Are we really? Okay, fine. All right, I'll get started with number 10. I, I said the relevant part, so now we're going to number 10. I number 10, I have Chicago White Sox shortstop Tim Anderson. Ryan, who do you have? Uh, From the St. Louis Fraud and Nulls, I have Paul DeJong. James, who do you have at number 10? I also have Paul DeYoung. And Jackson. I also have Mr. Timmy Anderson. At number nine, I have uh, Minnesota Twins newly acquired shortstop, uh, Andrelton Simmons. Right, who do you have? I have Andrelton Simmons as well. I also have Andrelton Simmons. I don't have Andrelton Simmons. I have Trey Turner. Hmm. At number eight, I have... Uh, Chicago Cubs shortstop Javier Baez. Uh, this is where I put Trey Turner. Okay. I have Carlos Correa at eight. Um, you guys, can, we'll get into that later. I mean, I have Carlos Correa at eight too. So. At number seven, I have uh, Washington National shortstop Trey Turner. This is where I put Javier Baez. At number seven, I have Corey Seager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I have Glaber Torres of the New York Yankees. Whoa. <laughs> at, number six, at number six, I have um, San Diego uh, Padres shortstop uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. Here's where I have the Dodgers shortstop, Car uh, Corey Seager. At number six, I have Washington National shortstop Trey Turner. And Jackson, who do you have? Well, I put Turner at six, too. Hold on. Hold on. Didn't you have Turner at eight? Or yeah, nine? okay. Yeah. Um, you just reset your top, or your, your 10 through six. Right? So you. <laughs> <laughs> I got two turns. Um, so that's a problem, right? Uh, so I guess I'll just put, uh, I don't know. Did you? It's Tatis there. I had Tatis at five. Seager? Don't spoil it. Well, I, I don't have a six. Do you have Seager there? No, wait, no, slide everybody up. Oh, Bogarts. Oh, no, you okay, have Bogarts. Well, then, okay, so I guess at six, I have Torres then. And I guess at 10, I'll put Javier Baez. All right, so everybody slides down a bit, obviously, Baez slots in at 10. And number five, number six, like I said, Tatis. Uh, 
Ryan, who do you, you said you had Seager, right? Uh, at five? You said, no, you said Turner for six, right? No, no, for no, no, for eight, I had uh, Turner. Seven, I had Baez. Six, I had Seager. You want me to say my five now, right? No, no, I'm just going through. No, six. we're at six right now. We're going. Oh, through okay. Six. So I have Dijon ten, Simmons nine. Okay, we Turner, get it. Eight, but yeah. And and James, who do you have at six? Uh, I have Trey Turner at six. And uh, Jackson, you said you had Torres at six. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> I have Los Angeles Dodgers future Yankee shortstop Corey Seager. Uh, I have Carlos Correa at number five. I have the best defensive shortstop in baseball, Chicago Cubs shortstop Javier Baez at number oh, five. Boy. And I've got uh, the face of baseball, Fernando Tatis Jr. At number four, I have New York Mets shortstop Francisco Lindor. At number four, I have Xander Bogarts. At number four, I have the face of baseball, Fernando Tatis Jr. And I have Mr. Not Future Yankee. Corey Seager. Number three, I have future Yankee Boston short Boston Red Sox shortstop uh, Xander Bogarts at number three. I have Francisco Lindor at number three. Are you really going to have Tatis top? Okay. I have Xander Bogarts at number three. I have the man trapped in hell to restore. And number two, I have Houston Astros future Yankee shortstop Carlos Correa. That's bang, just bang, good. buzz, buzz. Yeah, yeah. Of the yeah. NL West. Ooh. At number two, I have Trevor Story. Whoa. At number two, I also have Trevor Story. At number two, I have number two, Xander Bogarts. At number one, I have future Yankees, current Colorado Rocky shortstop, Trevor Story. We're going to have like nine shortstops, but yeah, Trevor Story at number one for me. <laughs> I, have, I have Fernando Tatis Jr. at number one. He's the best shortstop. Oh, baseball. my God. I, said, I have the actual best shortstop in baseball, Francisco Lindor, at number one. I, I of course, agree with James here. Okay. You I, know what? I thought, you thought Bogarts was the best. Real be quick, I have no. no I, ha- I have not really much of an issue with Ryan's Tatis ranking. Jackson, what the fuck? Why is Glaber <laughs> top six? Why is Glaber top six? He, he mashes. I know he can't mash for shit. Wait, he, no, no. He, he's he's right. right. Yeah. He right, mashes with a nine Bogart. with a nine point higher WRC plus than Javier Baez, who quote unquote <laughs> can't hit. No, I mean so, okay. Well, well, about, for me, was, was I think he's gonna have a big twenty twenty one offensively. Uh, I get his defense is horrific, hor- like horrifically horrific, but I think the offense is gonna make up for it. And and like the difference for me between six and ten is so little that any one of them could be anywhere. Well, I have Torres at fucking. 14 or something like that. So <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's actually cr- okay. 14 I is have, crazy. I, I have him um, again. Like it's all relative. I have him like 11th or 12th because I probably call him better than like Bichette. But is. I had Bichette right over him. In like, back. but I, but I pro- I'd probably say he's better it's than also Anderson. A bad defender. Bichette Twilight can't play Bichette defense. Dude, defensively, put it this way. He's like, all right, first of all, Jackson, I do have a question for you. Why yeah. wouldn't you have Bogarts at one and Seager at two if you don't care about defense? Because you clearly don't care no, about No, I do. I, I do. It's just for when you're talking like one, two, three, for me, it's all volume. And Lindor just has, Fine. has that. Like, and, and the difference between one and two is just like, it's so close. I just think yeah, Lindor is massive 2018. Just I, I preach all this, obviously, myself. So, I'm like, I feel like my five through nine or five through eight, Baez Turner. Seeger and Correa were, or including Tatis, four through eight were really hard to rank because they have such different amounts of volume. Because Tatis has only played in the league for a year and a half, even I, oh, yeah. I mean I think he it's less than that. It's it's not it's league. not even a full year. Yeah. He's still he's still been the best offensive shortstop yeah, we've seen sure. by far at that position. Yeah. By like, far, far no, no one as good as him. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, but he also. Like it's such a small sample size, but no one's better than him. At hitting. Oh, right. I, but like I, I could call yeah. Bogarts a better hitter than him, and it wouldn't be that no. crazy. Mm-mm. It's, it's easily, crazy. No, put it this way. Put, guys, put it this way: I could easily see any of my top six being number one, and I could. Yeah, see, that's fair. I mean, so if you have Tatis at one, I would probably have Seager right behind him, just because uh, the, the volume you, means you're probably weighing volume less. And I have Correa. I probably you probably have Correa too. Actually, excuse me. Um, I had Tatis no, at six the other play the season. I have Correa. I know this is probably going to be a big talking point, obviously. I, I mean, I, I hope not, but it probably would be after, you know, you guys yell at me and crucify Whatever it is. I have Correa, too, purely because his 2017 season, I easily could see him doing it again. 
2020 was a very weird year. Obviously, he had a couple injuries, which seems to be a recurring theme with him. But we know I don't really care as much as uh, injuries as the majority of you guys do. Yeah. Uh, Clay's ceiling is simply by far the best shortstop in baseball, in my opinion. No. And besides at this point, just because we've That's seen fair. that. That's fair. Uh, just because Correa has the potential to be like the best defensive shortstop in baseball uh, per OAA, DRS, all those metrics, they love it besides UZR, but UZR is kind of trash. So uh, if best we're looking at OAA and DRS, time. if we're looking at, OAA, if we're looking at DRS, he's like, I think uh, I'm pretty sure he's second or third since 2017, but you know, I, I could be, I could be wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's second or third since 2017. Uh, but he, he's a ridiculously good defender, a ridiculously underrated defender. And at his ceiling, you know, say whatever the fuck you want about the bang, bang, buzz, buzz, trash cans, all that. Still it's a very, good hitter. We don't think you're funny. Uh, or at least I don't. I can't really speak for everybody else. No, I don't That's think any funny. of us do. It's the opposite of hilarious. Right. And, and I, I think, like, I try to, like, say this a lot. Correa's ceiling is simply the second best shortstop in baseball. And I was very close to having him at one. But I, I do, you know, story, you know, uh, he, he's, he's uh, plus 120 WRC plus hitter. And uh, he, he's had more volume. And it, it same goes for Lindor. Bogart said couldn't really put it one because his defense is so, you know, bad. I, I really didn't. I considered it. At all. Uh, but I do good. have a number three. I, I could see the argument from a one. Same for Tatis. I was, I was you know, tempted to put Tatis at one as well. Seager, I didn't really consider either as much. I've seen people have Seager at one, which didn't make too much sense to me because you're kind of relying on ceiling where I think, you know, Correa has the second best and Tatis is the best or vice versa, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but sort of like how Jackson thinks Torres is going to have a, a big 20 – 21 which i guess sure that, that'd be cool i, I would kind of love that but yeah uh, same. I, I think Correa is gonna have a big 2021 too uh there was really no reason coming into 2020 he was gonna have a bad 2020 i'm just gonna say you know bang bang season bang shut the fuck up dude <laughs> <laughs> when i'm uh, See, I it's guess funny I'll, when james says it, it's ironic I'll, I'll conclude with my, my Correa point here before i get attacked viciously or not hopefully not not but. gonna really attack you viciously it's a tough position to rank all right, great. I'm glad because I've been attacked initially for tough positions to rank. I'm, yeah, well, I'm, okay, well, this this, this is like far, such a tough. Maybe, maybe the rank. when you rank them yourself, you realize how hard it is. Hmm? No, no, I just ranked them myself. It was pretty hard, but I can't have somebody who in three seasons has made 1,000 plate appearances as a top five shortstop. I, yeah, the only reason the, he's top five. I no, like the, the thing put him as like six. But the yeah, thing but is, Tatis hasn't played three seasons. He's played like what, he a also, year and he, sixty games. I'm he also that. actually has like a healthy season, being really good under his belt. Like Seager does as well, but Seager has been more injured, way more consistently. I mean, Tatis has that injury in 2019, but he's had been he's been consistently more injury prone than Tatis has. The same thing with Correa. So that's why I docked them for different reasons. One has a shorter sample size because being a rookie and one injury. Correa and Seager have different has lower sample sizes because they've been consistently getting injured and injured and injured and injured. So that's why I had I held them to a little bit of a different standard. Story and Lindor, I 100% considered number one. Like if Tatis didn't do what he did this year, which was, you know, hitting the crap up the ball, I think he had like a nine, near 96 mile per hour exit velocity. I mean, the dude was just mashing all year and his expected weight on base average, DRC, plus, just all that stuff. I mean, he was incredible. If it wasn't for him doing that, I think Story and Lindor are my one and two or whatever order you want to put them in. Lindor, I understand that he can be overrated at, at times by casuals, but by people, by in the sabermetric community, I think it's very popular right now to dunk on Lindor, but Lindor has been been one of the most consistent shortstops, one of the most healthy shortstops, plays amazing defense, like amazing defense, is a good hitter for a shortstop, and I think the whole 2020, him having a 100 winning runs created plus, I think that's more of a fluke. If you look at his other metrics, he complete, he clearly underperformed. It was what, 50, he, I think he played 55 games? He played, he played every game this year. Okay, he played every game, so 60 games. That's nothing, okay? 60 games. I mean, he slumped towards the end of the season. I think it's crazy to go, oh, the guy has a 100 winning runs created plus last year. He's not that good. Like, let's not get crazy here. Yeah, no, I, I have him at four, like I said, but he could easily be one. Like, pretty much that same tier of shortstops. I'd probably have the top four guys in the quote-unquote S tier, and then I'd have Seager and Tatis and then Turner under him. Uh, yeah, I could easily see the Aryan for Lindor. Obviously, he leads in uh, Fangraphs War, which isn't the greatest for shortstops. Obviously, he uses EZR. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's won in our war too. I would bet he's probably won in our war as well. I, I have to check, but he's probably up there. Um, with like I was saying though, I, I'm I probably have story over him no matter what. But they're very similar players. Again, Correa, uh, 
Correa, I, I already touched on the ceiling. I already talked about that. Uh, the Bogarts ranking, again, interchangeable. It's really just about a matter of how much you care about shortstop defense. And I, I do care about defense clearly a lot, as you all guys all know. The best defensive shortstop in the league, so I mean. Who is? Bogarts. Him and Devers oh. are the best left side of the infield defensively I've ever seen. Okay, Incredible. Bogarts, I mean, his, to be fair, his defensive rating, I know it's not a very great stat. But it's not the worst in the since, world, though. Since 2015, it's been positive every year. Defense is weird, dude. It's like his, his DRS is terrible. His OA is less terrible. His UDR is positive. His defensive rating is positive. It, it's hard to, like, know what to look yeah. at. De- it, it's, it, well, well his, defensive, like, his defensive, like, like DEF, whatever, is it's going to be because of the positional adjustment. So, like, yeah. everyone's positive. Even you have to be really, you have to be really, really bad defensively to make it negative. Like, Hicks had his yeah. first negative DEF season last year because he was just horrific out there in center field. Um, like, but I mean, the only player who I, I have as these 14 shortstops that I put in the fan graphs, like leaderboard here, uh, that has a negative D, DF like is, right? is Glaber Torres. And yeah. even, even Tatis is positive. Even Anderson's positive. Even Turner is positive. Well, Tatis was really good last year defensively. Like, he was actually yeah. pretty good last year defensively. It, it, I mean... Yeah, I was going to say it's pretty weird, though. Positional adjustments in general, just because, you know, designated hitters automatically get that negative 15, which is reasonable, but they're saying 15 uh, at zero is average. And is zero really average if you're, if you're looking at that kind of scale with positional adjustments? Probably. Right. But well, that's because I, I want to touch on your Correa has the highest ceiling thing because you're saying like, oh, you think he can do what he did in what, 2016, 2017 again? Yes. And even when he reached his highest ceiling, he had a five win season. Are you looking at R or F or F or but F4. Oh, sorry. I mean, I could like pull up his R war, but even then, like he even in his hit his like peak season, he played 100 games. Hundred and nine. Yeah, I know. Didn't I, Lindor have like a seven point eight win season and, two years and, ago? And Lindor in twenty eighteen had an eight win season, long. which is what I was gonna say. So yeah, I feel like I, I don't see a reason why Lindor yeah. couldn't replicate his eight win season. Yeah, no, uh, just hear me out here. Again, Correa seven and then six wins. Uh, sorry, seven wins twenty sixteen, six wins six point six wins in twenty seventeen. Uh, twenty eighteen, obviously. Using what metric, Arwar? R war, yeah, this I'm going. Yeah, right. R war is. Oh, I use a lot for four stops. 2019, this guy, he played again 82 games. He was ridiculous. 3.5 F four, probably. I would bet it's like an eight on the scale, like probably eight F four if you put it on. Per a, what? Per 650. What per, per 650 per 160, whatever you want to, whatever scale you want to put it on. Well, I do 650, but it doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah, what, yeah, that's fine. It, it would probably be around. I would guess eight ish. So yeah, as for Lindor's ceiling, uh, I, I don't think he's going to be the same hitter he was. Uh, I, just because I, if I, I'm, I'm not wrong, he didn't hit the ball incredibly hard in his 2018 season. But again, I could be because I'm not, I don't have in front of me right now. Um, if anyone wants to pull that up, that'd be great because I can. Uh, is, is DRC plus and expected win on base average in 2018 were not as good as Craig's in 2017, I believe. Um, regardless of the point, though, again, all interchangeable for me. Um, I, I just can climb. No, he he had a 381 x well in 2018. Oh, he did. Wow, I think Cray was like 400 around 400. Get for guys here. I, I hate so, the stat, well, but get rid of it. Hey, x was around. really weird for some DRC players. plus instead. I've had enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I I don't think that's much better, but no DRC plus and steam steamer weighted runs created plus projects better than x well and DRC plus. So I use that quite a bit. All right. Well, now let's look at his baseball perspectives thing. Um, but I'm not gonna uh, look. I, I didn't rank my list just based on the guys who are number yeah, one. Yeah, he had a, one, he had a two, one, three, one twenty eight DRC plus in yeah. So I I think he can hit around as Lindor. I think he consistently be a one twenty eight WRC plus hitter. Going yeah. forward, uh, but I also think Correa could consistently be around 135. And I, I guess you could probably prop Lindor up to 125. And I'd say their defense is relatively similar on a rate basis. So, again, this is all on, on the contingency that, that Correa is going to be healthy, which is a question mark. And I, I didn't really knock him for that health as much as, uh, you know, uh, you guys probably do. So I understand you guys having him. I wouldn't have him below six. So I was going to even knock him for the health. But again, I, I could I could understand if like the last four guys in your list are kind of interchangeable, because you know out of everybody, I kind of understand how there are tiers to lists, and it's not necessarily. So like I have a screenshot here from November eighteenth, twenty twenty, where Jack said, "Lindor is expiring and never going to get to to one hundred and thirty, meaning one hundred and thirty WRC plus." Yeah, I don't think so. And you just said he could get to one twenty five. That's not 130. That's 125. Oh, so like, that's a screenshot from it's, November. It's, He's a completely different person. It's the same thing. 
Chicho, bro, remember it was like November? four months ago. In yeah, November, if you pull up a screenshot for me, this is like negative 10. Okay, well, dude, dark. there's a screenshot of me on January 15th saying, who cares about Steamer? And now I use, I just use Steamer WRC Plus to just use, make no, a use part the of my list. Yeah, James, uh, nah, Steamer like, WRC Plus projects. Steamer WRC Plus projects. I think, projects I, think I don't, I don't see why Lindor couldn't. Yeah, have I can 130 see that. again and even like when he has a 130 of course this is 750 plate appearances which is another reason why i rank him so high is because he's he's always on the field he's so durable like lindor I, is never hurt yeah i don't have a problem with I, like i said i don't have a problem with lindor anywhere from four to one i think one player who can climb a lot simmons if simmons can go back to that 2017 to 2018 he's form, old. and he's old he's, he's old he's 31 i think he's old old. His defense is yeah, not- but but his defense has been like declining every year. It goes yeah, down. His, his hitting ceiling is not high. No, his, no, his hitting ceiling is like a hundred WC plus. But if you look at his if you look at his defense, just on a he's never relied on defense, speed. So he's probably, yeah, he's probably defense did not rely on his speed or raw athleticism. It was about you know quick reactions, whatever. I think this is actually a segment in Foolish Baseball's video uh, on Anderson Simmons. He talked well. about that a lot. You guys should watch that if you haven't already. But um, like I was saying though, I think Simmons could easily you know jump to six range, or he could fall to like fifteen. Yeah, if he, he sucks this year, he's gonna I'm gonna knock him off so hard. He has one more year. Bias is a better defender than him, by the way. Who? No, bias, bias. Yeah, I would take bias is a better defender. I think bias has another. Uh, if bias hits like he did in eighteen and, and maybe and, and like kind of eighteen nineteen range. Well, the he's thing about climb. the thing about bias is eighteen and nineteen is his eighteen like. Like his war in eighteen was only what five five point five wins, but as one thirty one WRC plus. But that's because he was playing second base. He's not a good defensive yeah. second baseman, which makes no sense to me. But maybe he just got better defense. I don't know, man. And so that's why I ranked him so high is because as a shortstop, I I, I tweeted this like two weeks ago. So, um, here since twenty nineteen, Baez has. Uh, 28 DRS per 1,350 innings at shortstop. Jesus. And uh, 19 outs above average per 1,350 innings at shortstop. Whereas, like, if you include Simmons, I and I took out 2020 because, like, I don't believe that Simmons is a negative defender. Like, the, yeah, I just, do I. Like, the, it's just not true. Like, he had a bad year this year, but he's not a negative defender. And so I have from 17 to 19, he's 29. DRS per 150 and 17 OAA per 150, 150 meaning 1350. But that's why I would put him higher is because he's a better hitter, better defender. And I'm not saying like comparing the two, but I'm just saying like he's also a better base runner, right? Is he defense defensively speaking, he is the best defensive shortstop in baseball. That's fair. All right. Well, I think Anderson can climb too. Anybody else have any complaints about anybody else's list? I I that's Anderson a good point. I think Anderson could climb, but I or he could fall a lot. If he sucks this year, it's going to confirm mm-hmm. everything I believe about his an, uh, uh, from an, an analytics standpoint. But mm-hmm. if he hits again, then if he has another four hundred bab of year, like I think we just like, give I, up on him. Just, yeah, we just give he's, up on him regressing yeah. because he makes no sense, and he'll just be like he's, the yeah, Kyle he's not going to hit the ball hard. Shortstops. But he he sprays it. Wait, no, he doesn't even spray it. He has exactly. He makes he no eight, sense. Eight, Eighth percentile spray score in twenty twenty. White Sox, but, right? but that's why I think he's going to regress. Steamer, Steamer WRC plus projects him to get to go to ninety one weight runs created plus. He's not going to go that far plus, though. His I think he'll be like plus, was not, It was one twelve last year, but in twenty nineteen, which was arguably his better offensive season, I think actually was was it, was it? I was I'm not sure. I haven't I'm not sure about the WRC plus, but it was below one hundred. His expected weight on base average is around that three thirty to three forty range. Um, you know. I don't know if that means he's going to be an act. Like if he's, he has to be in a way above average hitter, like around a 120, 130 range to be a top, a top 10 short stuff. If it falls below that, he's going to fall because he can't get his defense. hasn't been very good the last two years. Right. But I don't see why he couldn't be like a Xander Bogarts. Because he doesn't hit the ball hard. Yeah, no, Xander Bogarts is a much better hitter than him in every other projection metric, every other predictive metric, right, every but, other expected metric. But I, he, he I'm saying, like, hard. he doesn't he hit the ball hard, but, but, but you still have him top 10. You're the one who had him higher. I don't think I, I guess mine, because I, I forgot. I put Turner twice. So I had him 10. Yeah. But I was like, All right. But well, Bogarts just crushes the ball. Turner's also not a good defender. He's an all right defender. He's, he's up and down, but he's also a more consistent hitter, and he's one of the best base runners in all of baseball. He's an incredible uh, on terms of base run. He's like a seven point three or seven above seven BSR the uh, per six fifty or something like that over the last three seasons. Incredible base runner. Yep. I mean, yeah. 
All right. Anybody else have any other uh, gripes on anybody else's list before we can include this uh, segment of our podcast? Uh, I'm pretty good on everyone else's list. It's tough list. Yeah, I didn't have too much of a problem. Thanks for being reasonable and, and you know, hearing me out on Korea. It's nice. It's refreshing. Yeah. So. Well, you can hear me out on Korea being a... I, 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 see, I was like, you know what? That's fine. It's just I, too I have, I have him at yeah. eight, but like, I think if I were to... And I, I prefer tiers than like yeah. lists, right? I would put Lindor story, Lindor Lindor story Bogarts, Jesus Christ, as like your S tier, right? And then I put Tatis Baez, Turner, Seager, Correa as your next one. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then See, like I Simmons, like, DeYoung, all all those guys. Like I don't even know Polanco. He's he's not oh, a shortstop anymore. If Anderson, DeYoung have like, Bichette, well, Torres, they're 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 all like a B tier, I guess. For me, it's like Lindor, Bogey, Story, Seager, Tatis, and then it's everyone else. Yeah. Like, those five guys, you can probably. go anywhere, and then everyone else is just like, it's really like way out there. I would also say this. If De, if Deong, Dijon, I don't know if his last name anymore. I just, I mean, if he has another bad, because he's been up and down and up and down defensively, if this is another bad defensive season, I'm completely just dropping him off my list so far down into the abyss. Because the dude's defense has been so inconsistent on OAA, and I think DRS as well. If it's continuing to fluctuate, I'm not going to have – like, if it, it's not a really good defensive season this year, he's not going to ever touch my top 10 for, like, the next two Right, years. but, like, in 2019, he had a 26 defensive run yeah, save. Yeah, but then so in 2018 and 2020, it was negative. So, I'm just saying – In 2018, positive, he, had, he had 12 yeah, positive. I, I, it was oh, – but his OAA wasn't very good. What, what, yeah, is, but, is, I, I mean, like, you can't just use what, that's one of them because – average isn't going to go up playing next to Nolan Arenado. Wait, no, what was his DRS negative this year, though? I, I'm no, it was, it was literally zero. Good. Like, use ER and DRS because he's playing it next to the best Arenado. baseman in the NL. But his outs above average aren't going to look great. You saved yourself there with the NL part. I know. I was thinking about it. Snap uh, Chapman. Uh, that concludes our section of, or this section of today's podcast. Big shout out to Relevant. That, uh, that part of the podcast was sponsored by Relevant. As the entire podcast, make sure you go download the app. Uh, <laughs> R-E-V-N-T. Thank you to Relevant once again for sponsoring at this podcast. So To the moon, baby. To the moon. We're now moving into trivia. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Fanatics. If you're looking for the best authentic baseball gear and memorabilia, Fanatics is the place to be. They're hosting a giveaway on MLB Nerds Instagram. Go check that out. This pro- it'll probably be up by the time you've seen this podcast. If you've gotten to this point, thank you very much for listening. And take it away, James. It is trivia time. So, James, that is you know your thing. So take it away. I'm All right. Lot, by the way. I think it was what 20 to 10 now because you guys yeah. got like basically zero points last time. This time we have another themed round. I'll tell you the theme at the beginning. Your theme is Jersey numbers. Oh, I'm kind of good at these. So that's good news. Okay. And so we're going to have our easy round is going to be like, just quick, you know, you get a few seconds, I guess, but five questions for each of you, one point each um here we go so we'll start with jack then ryan jack ryan etc so jack we'll go with you first who wears number four on the st louis cardinals yeah you're really okay one for you ryan who wears number five on the atlanta braves number five is that freeman yes okay Jack, who wears number 27 on the Houston Astros? What? Wait, what? Am I, am I just forgetting something, like, super obvious? Is this very obvious and I'm just forgetting? Houston Astros, number 27. I give you five, four, what the fuck? three, um, two, um, uh, uh, one. Rambo Valdez? uh ryan do you know this um is it uh is it cranky no it's uh the guy who sent the astros to the world series oh my god what the fuck <laughs> look at that i guess i just i guess i just blocked it out of my i guess it's like pt i just well, how did i forget i forgot altuve was an astro for a whole minute there i, 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 I in my mind I, I said tony kemp was the second baseman for whatever reason Bro, I have to black. I don't know why I thought of, dude. I thought of Matt Kemp for some reason. Like I completely, Kemp? I can't, bro. I can't think of Altuve without getting PTSD. Ryan, uh, your turn. Oh my god. It's okay, pain. number ten. 
of the Philadelphia Phillies. That'd make sense. Is it Reese Hoskins? <laughs> that was that was actually Jackson's original guess, but then he said he wears seventeen. I don't know if that's true, but does. it's Hoskins it's seventeen and Ramuto wears number ten. Okay, so we are now at twenty two to eleven. I just I hate that team, so I don't really care for that team. Um, Jack, who yeah. wears number two on the San Diego Padres? Slam Diego, Crad Trent Padres. Rogers. Yes, it is Trent Grisham. So we are now there. How's that hard? It's not hard. It's Easy. they're all one point. Altuve sent the Astros to the World Series. That was pretty hard. But anyways, go ahead. Uh, um, Miami Marlins number six for Ryan. It's got to be. Is it Brian Anderson? No, bro. Don't I don't know that Marlins that well. I don't. All... Wait, did you say it, Jack? I said Marte, yeah. Strong yeah, Marte. okay. Oh, I forgot he got traded there. I thought it was still dying back. What? I, oh, that was Jack, weird. Boston, Red Sox, number zero. Uh, Chase Lynn. Whoa. Dude, what's his that name? A... What the is his name? No, his no, name, His it. name is Sue Lynn. No, you can't do that. You can't do you that. Can't you can't do that, do but his name is Sue Lynn. It's Ottavino. It is Ottavino. Fuck. I forgot that bum is on that team. Um, Bro, we're just so dumb. <laughs> Pittsburgh know. Pirate number twenty six. Adam Frazier. That was for Ryan. Adam Frazier, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. <laughs> Arizona Diamondback number thirteen for Jack. Number thirteen. Number thirteen. Are, are you yes. Sure? Oh, Nick Ahmed. Yeah. Okay, and Ryan. Right. Number 18 of the Seattle Mariners. Mitch Hanniger? Now that's a good guess, but no. 18 Mariners, 18 uh, Mariners, 18. I have a guess, but I think I could be wrong. You could say it one more time. You still won't get it. 18 Mariners? Uh, 15 is Seager. So 18 is... Uh... Andre Iguodala. Oh, Kikuchi. All right, so at the end of that round, we are at 25 okay. to 14, but we still have medium and hard questions worth three and five points each, as always. Okay. So, Jack, what players' numbers have been retired by at least three teams? And then I need all of them, and they're, I don't need their numbers. I just need their names. Uh, that's kind of difficult. You don't think that's kind of difficult? <laughs> Well, three teams is a lot of teams to retire your number. Is the answer Jackie Robinson and that's it? No. But Jackie Robinson is one person. Ryan, you're muted. Is it Jackie Robinson, Reggie Jackson, and... uh... Wait, Reginald? What? Reggie Jackson. He only yeah, played for two teams. No, he played for three. Didn't he play with the Angels? He played with the Angels, Athletics, and Yankees. Yeah, I didn't know he was retired by all three. I thought it was. I was thinking guess. I don't fucking know. Um, no, I think it might have. I, I have no idea, really. I have no idea. That, so then I got it wrong. So I'm already wrong. What? You well, didn't you guess, though. Be, and I mean, it could be. I could be trying to trick you. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm going to stick with Reggie. I think it's so. It's Jackie Robinson, Reggie Jackson, and then you said so. You said three teams, right? Yeah. And I think there's no other player retired universally, they're having their number universally retired in MLB other than Jackie Robinson. Clemente um, should be, but that's a different thing. Yeah, no, I want Clemente to be as well. Um, is it? Uh, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm stuck on those two. That's all the only two I can think of. Jackson got this pretty easily. Oh, it's not Reggie because Reggie CJ Crowen wore forty five four, actually. <sighs> no, the True. Angels. I remember that, but um, I don't even I didn't even know Reggie Jackson played for the Angels. It was a yeah, uh, yeah. a different Angel. Astro and Ranger by the name of Nolan Ryan. Mm, this is the only guy, and didn't Jackie Robinson? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't think that was a very obvious one that I didn't think of. Yeah, anyways, Ryan, you're talking. All right, Ryan. Who was uh-huh. the first player to get their jersey number retired? First MLB player, obviously. This feels too easy. Uh, this isn't very too easy. Uh, it feels like something that's going to be a very obvious player, and I can't think of them. Um, 
Was it? Can I? Oh, can I ask if it was post or pre integration? You can, but I'm not going to answer. Okay. Uh, um, is it is it Hank Aaron? Really? I, I don't know this. I That's really so late. Uh, oh, like, okay, but I would have guessed fucking Hank Aaron or something like that. Too. Yeah. Thanks. You give me a hint. I didn't okay. think about Jersey. I didn't think Jersey's retirement um, happened. I'm going to guess. It's going to be one of those. Companies. Is it Rogers Hornsby? No, it is uh, Yankees legend. Babe Ruth? Lou Gehrig. Oh, I guess wow. Ruth. Guy, I guess. Wow. Garrett got his number retired before Ruth. Well, didn't Gehrig retire before Ruth? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he had the Luke. He had. The I think Luke. that I think that's why he had like ALS, right? And then they yeah, retired yeah. it. That probably makes sense. They wanted to retire it before he died. So. All right, so here's one that Jackson and I both didn't know, but I think you guys might. Probably In 2020, not. a New York Yankees pitcher wore the number 89, the final number between zero and 99 to be worn. Oh. Who wore it? Yeah, yeah, hooray! Oh, that's not fair. That's so easy. <laughs> It's the easiest is, question is, in the is, world. Is, is that easy? Yes. Yeah, we we know. watch the Yankees every single. That's the easiest well, question. Well, I could. World. I couldn't tell you anything about like what numbers we're both Cubs Yankees players were. Like, 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 like I could tell you Rizzo wears forty four, Bryant wears seventeen, but like if you yeah, but ask me some like so random dude like, like that, it was like a thing. It was like a big thing. People like, like people yeah about it. It was like in the broadcast. So. Oh really? Oh, yeah. Um, I just found that on Google. So maybe that's, it was a big thing. That's some, that's that should be in a medium question at the rate. All right. So we'll, we'll count it as a medium. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm uh, kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Omar Vizquel wore this player's retired number 11 for the Chicago White Sox in 2010 and 2011 with the player's permission for the re and I'll give you the reason why is because they were both from the same country. Who was the player? Ooh, okay. Um, hmm. And if that made no sense, I can repeat it, but I think it probably So they're from the same country. This player played with the White Sox and is a White Sox legend, I'm assuming. And got his number retired by the Ozzie team. Guillen. Oh, but I know. Then... Who... Is uh, it Ozzie Guillen? No, it's not. Okay. Luis Aparicio? Yeah, it is. Let's go! Oh, what? Let's go. I'm embarrassed. That's Ryan, Ryan, try not to be down by three touchdowns challenge. It is 35 to 14. Well, I'm going to pull, you know, this is not fair. You gave him a freaking easy question. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that I clearly was an easy question Sox. for him. I hate the White Sox. Also, by the way, I mean. Well, I only know Luis Aparicio because of the show. So. Yeah, I'm playing with the show. If you can fair. You don't really ask. Uh, well, he's, so he's also a 13-time All-Star. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Thir- yeah, he can be a 13 time MVP. I don't care. I don't care. That's, that's, that's harsh. So, what's the score? It is 35 for Jack. Wait. And 14 for Ryan. Why would Aparicio give his number to someone who isn't a Hall of Famer and should not touch the Hall of Fame as a glorified Jose Iglesias? That's weird. Yeah, that's, that's really weird. weird. That's really weird. Anyways, that concludes this section of today's podcast. Big thank you to Fanatics again for sponsoring this podcast. Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much all we got for trivia for today. Uh, that concludes our episode for today. Thanks so much for watching. A big thank you to Relevant and Fanatics for uh, sponsoring t- uh, today's podcast. Links will be in our uh, descriptions on Instagram and Twitter at Deep Drive Pod. Make sure you go follow us over there. Follow me on Instagram at Emily Nerds if you don't already. Follow Ryan uh, on Twitter at Ryan Garcia ESM and follow his uh, or subscribe to his YouTube channel uh, at Yankee Stat Talk. Both yeah. Yankee Stat Talk and uh, Emily Nerds are also on Relevant. When you download the app, uh, go follow those and join the Emily Fanatics and Deep Drive Podcast vibe. It has been Deep Drive to Left Field by Castellanos, and we'll see you next podcast episode. Eight is next or seven, right? I think it's seven or eight. No, it's eight next. Uh, so today's episode it is seven. eight next. <laughs>